welcome to today's teaching, Understanding the Multiplicity of Jewish Identity. My name is Jasmine Pichardo. I am Assistant Director of Diversity Training and Education in our Office of Diversity and Inclusion. And I am very pleased to be joined by our esteemed panelists who are colleagues, collaborators, and thought partners in this work. Um, so as we start the program, I wanted to take a moment uh, to amplify our land acknowledgement. Uh, this acknowledgement was written uh, by our colleagues at MICA, Multicultural Involvement uh, and Community Advocacy, alongside the consultation of Piscataway Elders. And so it reads, every community owes its existence and strength to the generations before them around the world who contribute to their hopes, dreams, and energy into making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will. Some were drawn to migrate from their own homes in hopes of a better life. And some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical in building mutual respect and connections across all barriers of heritage and difference. At the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, we believe it is important to create dialogue to honor those that have been historically and systematically disenfranchised. So we acknowledge the truth that is often buried. We are on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway people who were among the first in the Western hemisphere. We are on indigenous land that was stolen from the Piscataway people by European colonists. We pay respects to Piscataway elders and ancestors. We take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. Thank you. Um, I want to take a moment to offer some framing for today's program. Um, as folks who have been joining us for the past year uh, are familiar, our teachings focus on shedding light and amplifying conversations about race, racism, and anti-racist practices that can support us in shifting our campus culture so that it better aligns with our commitment to equity and justice. Over the course of the year, members of the Anti-Racism Teach-In Planning Group have been in deep dialogue about what it means to be in solidarity with other members of our community and what it looks like in practice. In these conversations, the words of Audre Lorde, a queer Black feminist, were indispensable to our thinking. She wrote, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. There is no hierarchy of oppression. I cannot afford the luxury of fighting one form of oppression only. I cannot afford to believe that freedom from intolerance is the right of only one particular group. And I cannot afford to choose between the fronts upon which I must battle these forces of discrimination, wherever they appear to destroy me. And when they appear to destroy me, it will not be long before they appear to destroy you. What is clear to us is that oppression, is that our oppressions are intricately connected and solidarity requires us to be in community with one another to understand each other's experiences and struggles. While the anti-racism teaching will continue to be guided by anti-racism, and this will continue to inform our programming, we recognize that in order to transform our campus, our conversations need to center solidarity and anti-oppression work. Our teachings will continue to expand on our solidarity series so that we can use our platform to amplify the voices, experiences, and activisms of marginalized communities on our campus and the multiple systems of oppression that impact us all. It is with this framing that we launched today's program, which aims to highlight the multifaceted nature of Jewish identity and the range of experiences within the Jewish community. 
Our hope is that it will serve as an entry point for deepening our understanding of anti-Semitism from an anti-oppression lens, which we will delve into in future teach-ins. With that in mind, I now invite our Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion, Dr. Georgina Dodge, to give a special thanks to all those who were involved in making this event possible. Dr. Dodge. Thank you, Jasmine, I appreciate it. And I am very pleased to welcome you to this important discussion about Jewish identity and experiences. And as Jasmine said, this is the first in a series of conversations that we will host about Jewish identity and anti-Semitism. The dates have not yet been set for the ongoing conversations, so please stay tuned and we will announce those as they are finalized. And I, most importantly, I really want to take a moment to thank all of you for being here. And I also want to thank those who have made this programming possible. Of course, I want to thank our esteemed panelists. We so appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. It is truly a gift. You will have an opportunity to hear from our panelists and you'll see them on camera, but we all know that there are many people behind the camera who have contributed in diverse ways. Of course, the team in diversity training and education and the staff in ODI have been central to our efforts and I thank them for their work. There has also been a volunteer planning committee and they have given of their time, their knowledge and their passion and we are very grateful to their contributions. And there is a slide with the names of the committees. Um, it's, it's, it's a large planning committee, so I won't go through everyone, but I do want you to know that we thank each and every one of you. And in addition, this programming has been made possible by anonymous donors who have such a stake in the conversation and who want to support the work of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion and the University of Maryland. They want us to be a truly inclusive campus. They want us to be a place where these difficult, sometimes difficult conversations can take place. And while I am grateful to the financial support that they have provided, that enables us to present you with this programming. I really want to thank them for serving as a catalyst to bring us together in this conversation. A discussion about Jewish identity and anti Semitism from us here in ODI is overdue. And I'm delighted that it is happening now. So thank you all for being here. And I hope that you learn much from this initial conversation. Thank you, Dr. Dodge. Um, I now wanna to proceed to introducing our panelists, uh, an introduction that is long overdue. Um, I'll start with uh, Yosef Webb Cohen, pronouns they, he is an educator committed to supporting individuals and communities in their journeys for personal, social, and cultural growth and change. Yosef is the co-founder and senior educator of the Calico Hill Collective, developing experiences to support individuals and communities who are seeking to strengthen their capacity to live out their justice values and to engage effectively, ethically, and authentically across identity differences. Yosef has taught middle school students through octogenarians and loves facilitating educational opportunities for students of all ages. Yosef received his Master's of Divinity from Wellesley Theological Seminary in Northwest Washington, DC, and a BA in Anthropology with an emphasis on archeology span from CSU Sacramento. Sacramento. Yosef is currently pursuing an MSW at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, and is a social work intern at the VA Medical Center in Baltimore, Maryland. Our next panelist is Nalaya Knafo, a senior program assistant at the United States Institute of Peace, where she supports the Institute's youth program. She is also completing her MA in religion and the arts at Yale Divinity School, 
where her academic focus concentrates on Jewish Christian Muslim relations and the preservation of religious heritage during times of conflict. Nalaya's interests include interreligious community building and a deeper exploration of her own Jewish identity developed during her experiences studying in Jordan as a freshman in college. Nalaya graduated from American University in 2019 with a BA in International Studies, and she identifies as a modern Orthodox. Rabbi Ari Israel is in his 26th year as a Hillel Executive Director and returned to Maryland where he grew up in 2003 to work at the University of Maryland Hillel. In addition to rabbinic ordination, Ari has a master's degree in medieval Jewish history as well as secondary education, and is also an adjunct professor at the University of Maryland, teaching an upper level Jewish leadership course. Welcome, welcome. And last but certainly not least is our moderator for today's panel, Dr. Julie Ansis, uh, who is a professor of informatics and founding director of the cyber psychology program at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Dr. Ansis is a fellow of the American Psychological Association. She's been an active, she's been active in leadership roles at the American Psychological Association and other organizations, such as serving as chair of the APA's Society of Counseling Psychology's Section for the Adv Advancement of Women. She has received a number of awards and honors, including Woman of the Year and the Georgia State University Outstanding Research Award. Prior to her current position, Dr. Ansa serves as the Associate Vice President for Institute Diversity at Georgia Institute of Technology and was affiliated with the School of Psychology. She's also served as a tenured faculty member in, this, um, in the psychology department at Georgia State University. Um, so with those esteemed introductions, I do hand it over to our moderator, um, Julie, to take it from here. Thank you very much, Jasmine and Georgina, for uh, and everybody else here for organizing this really important panel. Um, I completed my psychology doctoral internship at the University of Maryland in 1994. So I have a particular fondness for the university uh, and the counseling center in particular, where I really received stellar training at that site as an educator, as a researcher who is focused on issues of multiculturalism, justice, and diversity all my life, and also is the founder of Psychologists Against Anti-Semitism with several hundred members, today's conversation is obviously an important one for me. As we continue to see a rise in anti-Semitism around the world, including college campuses, this is an opportunity for Jewish people to define their own Jewishness, to articulate the impact of anti-Semitism and Jew hatred on their lives, and discuss what Jewish identity or Jewish pride means to them. This is a diverse panel, and I am excited about diving in. This is meant to be a dialogue, a conversation among panelists, and we're gonna try to do that as best we can within this online format. We have about five major questions and hopefully we'll be able to cover all of these areas. So I'm going to start with the first question. Um, and the first question that I believe Yosef is going to, to begin in terms of answering, uh, is what does being Jewish mean to you? When did you begin to understand your Jewish identity? Thank you, Julie. Um, this is always an interesting question for me because it's, it's like trying to bifurcate a part of myself, if that makes sense. Like, how do I explain this aspect of myself? Because it's, for me, it's not an aspect of itself. It's, it's a part of who I am in every way, shape or form. Um, and I say that, and, and I want to acknowledge also, I, I'm a Jew by choice, which means I converted to Judaism at, at a point earlier in my life. So when I talk about um, when did I first start kind of 
understanding my Jewish identity, it happened a long time before I quote became Jewish, if that makes sense. Right. So uh, I remember being like 10 years old and my mom, who was Roman Catholic, taking me to a synagogue because she wanted to teach us, teach us about um, Hanukkah. And so we bought some dreidels so she could teach us about it. I'm like, oh, this really speaks to me. And it wasn't later in life until I was in seminary where I was like, oh, no, this is really the path that's been calling to me my whole life. So the idea of kind of like, what is what is being Jewish for me? It's, it's like uh, coming home or acknowledging who I am in a way that I hadn't done previously. Thank you, Yosef. Uh, would anyone else like to jump in and, and respond to Yosef's response or answer the question about what being Jewish means to you? I'd love to. Yosef, thank you so much for sharing your story. I completely feel the same. I, I feel like this question is so hard to answer because Judaism um, is just, it, it encapsulates such a huge part of my life, um, whether it's from everyday aspects like food or just my daily routine. Um, but it, it really is, it really is, it feels like home. And for me, I grew up um, in a traditional family and going to Jewish day school from a young age. So uh, Jewish identity was always a big part of my life, but it wasn't really until I started to grow older that I started connecting on a more personal level with my family's heritage. My grandparents from my mother's side of the family emigrated to the United States from Morocco after the Holocaust and World War II. And they brought a lot of their traditions and uh, Jewish heritage with them from Morocco. So um, I've been able, I think over the years as I've grown older to really connect with that part of my Jewish identity and um, just the beauty of the traditions that have been passed down from generation to generation throughout my family. And just um, off the top of my mind this past spring before I got married, one of the things that my husband and I decided to do to keep our to keep this heritage alive um, was to have a traditional henna ceremony, um, which was really exciting part of celebrating our upcoming marriage. So for me, uh, thank you. I appreciate that the response and I'm, I'm reminded Yosef of a uh, piece of Talmud. Talmud is a part of the oral tradition of Judaism where the Talmud makes a statement that Jews of choice make Jews who are born Jewish jealous because there's a there's a sort of system that says like, you chose this? And I grew up in a traditional home similar to uh, Nilaya and I, uh, I'm here and I have fond memories of my father taking me to synagogue when I was four or five years old and every morning and that parent-child bond and grandparents and and then it wasn't really till I was a teenager where I started to assimilate my own sort of beliefs and you know my teenage rebellious years where I sort of started to explore. And if you would have asked me when I was a teenager whether I would become a rabbi, I would have laughed and cried probably at the same time. And at some point I switched from pre-med to where I am now. And I fell in love sort of with Jewish peoplehood um, where Jewish identity sort of to, became part of my um, full identity. And it's part and parcel of who I am. And my last name being Israel, where Israel also plays a large part. So I met my wife actually in Israel. Our first child was born there. And it is part and parcel of my identity and hard to sort of to distinguish between the two. And for me, Judaism is about values and choice um, and about thinking about God's world and where I fit into that. And I actually teach a university course. And I just discussed with our students about distinction between being an American and that ability to um, have rights. I have rights for free speech, rights to express myself. And in Judaism, it's actually about obligation. I'm obligated to give charity. And that distinction between where my freedom is curbed, but my values, I believe, are enhanced because of it. Thank you, all of you. So I heard a lot about the, the sense of coming home or being home. Um, and being Jewish, being an integral part 
of your identity and in some ways um, being active in terms of this really being a choice, a choice to possess certain values um, and follow a particular path. So that's a more sort of internal question that was asked. Uh, and now we're going to take an external kind of perspective and think about how it impacts you internally. And so that this question um, is about assumptions, assumptions about what it means to be Jewish that you may have faced and how these assumptions have affected you or affect you now. Rabbi, Rabbi uh, Ari, could you start with that, please? Sure, uh, thank you. I first of all wanna thank you, Julie, for uh, facilitating the conversation and also uh, Dr. Dodge and uh, Jasmine and everyone at ODI and Micah for bringing us together. It's just uh, wonderful. And I think assumptions are, are critical in today's world because you know we do assume about our other things. We have stereotypes. Um, people see me as uh, as a traditional Jew, and you know they might feel that I am. Um, one assumption is I'm rich, and thank God I'm a rabbi, so I don't have to you know quick, quick, quickly dispel that 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 challenge. Um, people probably also perceive me as being aggressive or pushy, and while my parents are from Brooklyn, they escaped. And uh, I grew up here in Maryland, so I hope I have a little bit of a Southern flair. Um, but occasionally the Brooklyn side comes out. And uh, I think that's sort of a, a piece of that puzzle. Um, people probably make assumptions about what some of my attitudes are towards Muslims or about Palestinians and about you know, where I am and what my beliefs are um, in terms of some of that conflict area. And um, people also think probably from uh, looking at me from a traditional perspective about what my attitudes are towards women um, and women's rights and, and where that fits in. And finally, as a traditional you know, Jew working in the Hillel world, and Hillel is a pluralistic organization where we have multiple denominations under our umbrella. We have an LGBT group. We have reformed conservative and Orthodox Jews who are praying together. Um, people probably are a little confused about how we fit into boxes. And what I love about Hillel is we believe in a big tent. And that's sort of, you know, that attitude as well, um, and how we embrace everyone and fitting into that community. Anyone else want to answer that question? Thank you, Rabbi Ari, about assumptions in terms of what it means for you to be Jewish. Sure, I'll jump in here. Um, thank you, Rabbi Ari, for um, starting off this question. Um, I think when I think of this question, I just I I re reflect upon just the vibrant diversity um, within the Jewish community, especially in the United States, and some assumptions some assumptions that um, I have experienced from um, just my own personal background of what it means to be Jewish have um, have really revolved around uh, what it be means to be a Jewish woman. And uh, even though I, I grew up in a traditional home and as I spent um, my time in college learning and growing, um, I, I started to learn more and connect more with my Jewish faith and identity. And um, my observance also grew over time. And an assumption that I commonly experienced as I also grew in my career professionally and academically um, was um, that Orthodox women who identify as Orthodox um, stay home, take care of the family, um, that they, they don't really have a space in the public sphere. Um, and that wasn't really my experience at all. But I think as I've become, um, as after I got married, um, when I'm walking in the street and made the choice to um, cover my hair as a religious decision um, and as a sign of modesty um, as I embrace this new part of, of my life. And I think that that has also made me more visibly Jewish in public um, and has perhaps even um, amplified those, those assumptions. But like Rabbi Ari mentioned, um, some other assumptions that may um that i may have come across um included assumptions about um my uh my perspectives about muslims or um people of other faith or religions and also about um about israel and and um 
my my political affiliations. I actually, I, I like this question because it really, it's interesting, like I, I, I think about what Rabbi Ari said about like the big tent because Judaism really is a big tent. Um, and there's assumptions on what being Jewish is. So oftentimes people don't think I'm Jewish. They assume, oh, you're brown, you have a beard, there's something on your head, you must be Muslim, right? Um, I tend to wear like the bigger yarmulkes or kippahs, uh, and it surprises people. They're like, wait, you're Jewish? Um, I'm like, yeah, I am. Um, also, the diversity within the Jewish community, there's something in the world called Ashkenazi normativity, which is where people think all Jews are German, Eastern European, Ashkenazi variety of Jews. And that's a conversation for another time, all the different varieties. Like, and I, I actually follow more of a Sephardic style of Judaism. And so there's like these, these confusions, like, the way you pronounce Hebrew is different. And there's all these assumptions that you will be this thing, which I, I joke and say, uh, I think it was uh, Rabbi Sheesh Rashon said, um, when people in the United States think of Judaism, they think of either uh, Jerry Seinfeld or like the dancing Hasidic person, like with the black hat and long pants. And it's not those two boxes, it doesn't exist. And so it's interesting for me, oftentimes I'm perceived to not be in it's assumption like oh i i have an assumption what judaism is and you don't fit that box therefore you can't be jewish and it's and it happens within judaism sometimes too and it's just it's not necessarily a bad thing it's just an interesting thing you know so the way it affects me is it gives me the opportunity to help educate people like i i have a t-shirt that says uh this is what jewish looks like and i wear it and people go wait what you're jewish are, are you saying that in a funny way like no no i'm really jewish let me tell you about it um and so that's kind of just an interesting way that these assumptions manifest. Yosef, I resonate with that so much um, because I think that just an assumption in general is that when people look at you, the first thing that they think is something that is totally off from what you identify as or with. And I've definitely experienced that. I mean, I choose to cover my hair with a scarf rather than a wig just because um, of my Sephardic um, North African traditions. Um, and that's something that I think is, uh, it's a little different. I mean, where, where I'm living right now in um, New Haven, Connecticut, it's not a lot of people are out in the streets covering their hair with, um, with headscarves. So it has happened several times when people have mistaken me for, um, for being Muslim. But um, it's, yeah, I think it's that profiling that, um, that is such a common assumption that I definitely have experienced as well. Yeah, I mean, people make assumptions all the time. My children are na Nationals fans, and I grew up in the area, so I'm a Baltimore Orioles fan, and people wouldn't make that assumption, you know, sort of without digging a little deeper. And I think it's, you know, looking you two as well and not knowing your Sparta heritage and where that comes in and how you identify with that, I think is, is amazing. Um, as an Ashkenazi Jew, right, I do have the Eastern European uh, dis uh, descent, which you, Yosef, uh, were referring to. I think it's, you know, fascinating in how that, that comes up. There was a question in the chat. Julie, do you want us to address it right now about uh, head covering and wearing that in public? Is that something you want us to look yeah. at or you want to you wanna sure. wait a little bit? Well, we were going to wait. We were going to wait for the, the last uh, portion of this webinar to answer questions, but if you see something that jumps out and relates to what you're saying, go for it. Go I ahead. Mean, I, I, I think it does because actually all three of us are wearing head coverings and actually three different head coverings. You, have, you, know, you identified, you said a larger head covering, mine's a little smaller um, and I wear it all the time and you know, um, it's, it's different and also for a woman and a man and who does that and what stages of life and how people identify. Um, you know, I've worn my kippah, which is what I refer to as the Yosef used that word yarmulke, um, which is, uh, you know, based on a Hebrew word, which refers to the fear of heaven and about that God is above us. And, you know, we're covering it either for modesty or just for recognition. Um, I've worn my kippah literally all over the world. Um, I was on the air Egypt in 1983 as a young boy and um, wore my kippah and people could not figure out what I was doing there. And why I was there and my last name's Israel and they thought I was Israeli, but actually I'm an American. Um, and I actually wore my Kipalo through Europe. And uh, one time I was backpacking through Europe with a friend of mine and he refused to wear one. He thought it was, he was worried about it. And um, after a week of being together, I said, I'm wearing my Kipah, I'm proud. 
and I want to identify with that and the way people perceive me. I'm not worried about the trouble. I'm actually worried about hiding and I don't want to hide. I want, I want to be visible. And I think sometimes we do hide and there are safety issues. I've never felt unsafe in America and in and Europe. And uh, we were at Friday afternoon and a person stopped us and we did not have anywhere for Shabbat. He was wearing a baseball cap. I was wearing my kippah and the person rolled down the window and said, um, do you have a plans for Shabbat, which is the Sabbath? I said, no, we don't. He says, why don't you join us? So I turned to my friend. I said, my kippah got us the invitation. You're not invited. Your baseball cap would not have been included. And sometimes when we hide, we actually could not figure out who everyone is. And I think it's important to sort of balance a safety issue, which is of concern, and also a public identification, which enables people to connect and uh, to feel a part of something bigger. Thank you. So you all you all talked about the diversity um, of being Jewish, that Jews are diverse racially, ethnically. They're diverse in terms of their perspectives, their experiences, their sexual orientations. We are not a monolith, right? Um, which, which feeds into the next question about anti-Semitism and their various definitions, uh, scholarly definitions, less than scholarly definitions of anti-Semitism, but uh, anti-Semitism tends to revolve around this notion um, or this simplistic notion uh, or stereotypic notion of what it means to be Jewish. And so I'd like if you could respond to the question around how you define anti-Semitism and how you see it show up today. Anyone would like to start on that? Go ahead and, and start um, on that question. So um, I think anti-Semitism, when, when I think, um, think of the term, I think of either a verbal expression, a belief or a hostile behavior um, directed towards Jews or even in a context with non-Jewish people. Um, and it's, it's hostile um, because it directly attacks Jews for their identity. Um, and I think a really big part of anti-Semitism um, that I personally have experienced um, as a Jew in the United States and also overseas from my experiences is um, the denial of the self-determination of, um, of Jews and their right to self-determination self in Israel. Um, most of that has come up in educational contexts from my own perspectives in, um, in, uh, in classroom settings and conversations. Um, and uh, that's speaking from my experiences, um, the educational um, experiences of anti-Semitism, but also just walking in the street, we were just talking about um, the experience of wearing visibly Jewish symbols um, in public. And I can say that for me, for my experiences, um, being married and choosing to cover my hair um, has attracted a lot of attention. And that's something that I hadn't previously experienced before. As Rabbi Ari mentioned, he, um, which I think is so powerful, he said that he doesn't want to be hidden. And I feel the same way as a Jewish woman. And at the same time though, um, when I'm, I've experienced since being married and covering my hair, I've experienced more public attention and anti-Semitism, verbal aggression in the street than I had previously as um, a single woman just walking around the street in public. Um, so um, I think it shows up in many different ways. So I'm going to ask, because um, Julie, you kind of touched on what I wanted to talk about, which is um, I do a lot of work in the diversity, equity, and inclusion realm. And uh, whenever we're in a training, I always put like three different definitions for anti-Semitism down, because there is no really a concise definition of anti-Semitism. I think that's part of the problem, right? So like you say, what is racism? You Here it is. You, you, you say, what is... Um, homophobia, Islamophobia, like you put them in there and you Google them and there's like an answer. And so the example I get is if you go to the ADL Anti-Defamation League, 
the U.S. State Department, and the U.S. Holocaust Museum, they all have different definitions for what constitutes anti-Semitism, right? And I just named those because those are three pretty big organizations to say, ah, oh, we think it's a little bit different than what you're talking about. And so, um, and how do I see it manifest? Well, I mean, most of anti-Semitism I see manifest itself in little ways, little microaggressions, little slights. Like I saw something, uh, a news article that said, it was trying to link something back to George Soros. Like if anyone says, oh, that has something to do with George Soros, that's an anti-Semitic dog whistle, right? The people who understand anti-Semitic language will hear that. The people who don't, won't, right? So it's, there's these very small innocuous things you hear that if you're someone who likes to spread anti-Semitism or someone who's affected by anti-Semitism, you get very uh, understanding of that. And, and it's, it's interesting, like um, as Rabbi Ari was talking about, uh, like kind of like where you walk around displaying yourself openly as a Jew, right? Um, like I more times than not will have my uh, tzitzis, which is the ritualistic fringes that Jewish men tend to wear. I keep them tucked in my pants versus hanging out just because I tend to be in areas, not that I'm necessarily worried about being attacked, but also I don't necessarily wanna walk around going, hey, look at me, I'm over here by myself and I'm Jewish, you know? Because in my experience, when we start talking about like the, the violent attacks of anti-Semitism, which I think are, are much less than say the, the, the language of anti-Semitism, it's always tends to be people who openly are, known as Jews, right? You see the Hasidic men or, or women getting attacked because people look and go, oh, they're Jewish or Jewish places like synagogues and graveyards because you can look at it and go, that's Jewish. And that's where those attacks come from. So I think part of the issue with anti-Semitism is how insidious it is. And that oftentimes it's, it's directed in a way that is uh, violent towards people who identify as Jewish openly. Yeah, and I appreciate that. I really do. And thank both my co-panelists here for, for helping frame that. And I agree there isn't a precise, concise definition. And it's certainly one of those things when you see it, you know it. Um, and it takes, it rears its ugly head in many different ways. Uh, personally, as a teenager growing up in Silver Spring, Maryland, I was beat up by some older white thugs, me and a friend of mine, and, and it hurt. Um, it didn't define me. Um, yet I will defend against it. And I think we need to balance um, a fear that people live with, and it's real. And here at Maryland, uh, unfortunately, we've had, and just even recently, a few weeks ago, there was a swastika drawn on a whiteboard um, against a Jewish student uh, in a dormitory. And what is our obligation to speak out against that? And what is our obligation to ensure that it doesn't happen? How do we educate? And I'm grateful for ODI and MICA for and the University of Maryland for addressing this, because I hope that we can, you know, express the 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 feeling that Jewish students occasionally feel um, either verbally attacked, uh, certainly their identity is attacked. Um, it manifests itself a lot of times around Israel. Um, where many people, and I mentioned this before, where Zionism is not just a political belief of a country afar, but it's part and parcel of who I am and my identity. So when someone's critiquing um, the state of Israel in an unfair and biased manner and making false claims about genocide and ethnic cleansing, um, they are directly critiquing and demeaning my Jewish identity. And I think that's an important distinction to make um, it's not about a political conversation. I do believe that we need to have a political conversation and I'm praying for peace every single day. It's a huge part of my daily prayer and how we bring that back and back, you know, in an active manner. And yet the critique is not simply from a distance and saying, hey, just toughen up a little bit. It's, it's really goes to the heart and the matter of what it means to be a pro-Israel person. In this case, a pro-Jewish person. I hope we respect that and we don't pull anyone else down with us um, when that happens. And how do we build each other up as opposed to trying to pull each other down? And that happens too often. Well, if I can, if I can add real quick to what you're saying, Rabbi, um, my, almost every discussion that I in, engage in that involves around Israel, I say, how are you different, just 
how are you defining the term Zionism? Because what I have learned is in these conversations, no two people have this, has the same definition of what that means. And I would argue this for any conversation, any dialogue you're having, get your definitions out of the way first. Because if, if two people are having a conversation about a thing, but they don't actually agree on what the thing's definition is, you're not actually having a conversation about the same thing. So I just would offer that. Uh, I, I agree. I'm happy to have the conversation now. I just want to let Julie, uh, let, I'm saying, <laughs> make sure Julie has enough time. And, and uh, I do agree that we have to be clear. Um, and we also have to be really clear that when borders and boundaries are crossed, um, it hurts. And, and I know you're not, not saying that. And uh, I do think we need to be crystal clear about um, that certain pieces of identity are part and parcel and everyone has their own comfort zone um, from that perspective. And um, yeah. So I'm glad you, you brought this up. Um, I was gonna ask uh, the panelists this question. Um, and I think Nalaya, you started with talking about the issue of self-determination, which is essentially what Zionism is. Um, so what are your thoughts about uh, your definitions of Zionism and how Zionism often uh, gets incorrectly equated with racism? Yeah, that's a great question, Julie. I was actually going to um, just share personal anecdote and that partially answers this question um, for our next question that's gonna be asked, um, but I can touch on it now. And um, it's just an experience of anti-Semitism that I first actively was aware of um, experiencing anti-Semitism in such a direct and aggressive way. Um, growing up in a Jewish community and being surrounded by Jews my whole life, I hadn't really experienced anti-Semitism before coming to college. And in this particular experience, um, anti-Semitism, Zionism, the presence of Zionism really, really, um, and the self um, denial of self-determination of Jews and the existence of Israel was so, um, it was it was really like it, it had such a large presence that um, it was almost impossible to not characterize this event as anti-Semitism. And it was during a time when the summer right after my freshman year, year of college, I um, had traveled to Jordan. I was studying Arabic at the time and I was really excited because my whole undergraduate career was really focused on um, conflict resolution and I was so motivated to um, use my language skills to later on um, work with peace building and that's what I'm doing now and just interreligious dialogue and, and conflict resolution. And when I had gone to Jordan, I er, very early on had sensed um, fear and caution to disclosing my Jewish identity openly um, just because of my experience with this particular anti-Semitic event. And, when I was there, it was in 2017 during a very politically fraught time. And it was when um, Israel had made the decision to close the Temple Mount um, because two Israeli soldiers had been killed by um, Palestinian gunmen. And um, there were, in response to this political event that took place, there were a lot of protests and violence um, and anti-Semitism in the Arab world and specifically in Amman where I was staying. And, a lot of the conversations that came up with um, some colleagues and uh, language partners were really around the concept of the Jewish people um, having, having stolen the land of, um, from Palestinians. And I think that this, I mean, this is a very, this is from my own personal experiences and it's a very, I think, extreme example of anti-Semitism that I had experienced, not something that you would typically experience, I think, every day, but um, uh, hopefully not. But um, it was really this denial of the existence of the state of Israel, um, chance death to Israel and protests that were happening very closely to where I was living and just a large misunderstanding of Judaism. And Israel as, 
a place is so interconnected in Jewish identity in a religious sense. Um, politically, there are, I think there, um, uh, there are different perspectives, but um, the connection that Jews have with Israel is, um, it's a part of, from my perspective, it's a part of Jewish identity that's very important to recognize. Um, and I often wonder what I would have done differently um, in the experiences, the anti-Semitic experiences that I had encountered during my time in Amman, because um, I actually, I stayed silent because I was so nervous and I was scared to put myself at risk as a young Jewish American woman living in this situation. And even though these were some of the most challenging moments um, that I had experienced where I felt like I had to hide part of my identity and I felt very restricted in, in the choices that I was making in my religious observance overseas. Um, I really thought that what I learned was that it's important to feel um, not to let these experiences victimize you and instead to let them empower you. And for me, um, like Rabbi Ari was saying earlier, um, it, this experience in particular moved me to learn more about Israel, its connection to the Jewish people to better respond to situations like this next time I would be faced with them and to also pursue the professional experiences that I um, have the privilege of um, continuing now and also my academic experiences at Yale. I would, I would add to that um, from my own experience. Um, I think the key component um, when we're talking about Israel is the, as, as Rabbi Ari was saying, is, is the unfair critique, right? The, un, the, the critique that's like, like, you're not holding anyone else to that same level of accountability. And what I've actually, um, in my head more than anything, when I start engaging in some of those conversations, um, if you want to hold me accountable for what's going on in my country and who's in charge right now, fine, right? Because I either am or I'm not doing enough politically to engage that. I can't vote in the election in Israel, right? So like how that country is being guided, sure, I have family there. I've been there twice, I really like the state of Israel. Um, and I, I can't be held responsible for the, for the political party in charge and what they're doing. I'm not Israeli, right? Like, you know, you're saying I, I'm an American, Jewish American woman, right? I'm, I'm a Jewish American man. I'm, 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 in, I'm from the United States. Um, and I think, I think that the idea of holding every Jew responsible for what happens in Israel is, is, is part of the, just a piece of the anti-Semitism as I've experienced it. This idea like I have to hold you individually responsible for what's going on over here. I can't even control what goes on in my own HOA half the time, right? So please, please, you know, does that mean I don't try to engage with things that are happening on the grounds of justice in Israel? Yes, but I do in other countries as well. Cause I don't, I don't, you know, that, 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 that focus on just Israel is the insidious part. Um, I have, I have, uh, some friends who are very much associated with the divest movement and some folks in that movement are not anti-Semitic and some are. The problem is how do you parse out the difference and has that movement done its own work to parse out that difference? And I would argue, no, you know, it's, 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 you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And I think the problem with that is. For me, and it doesn't, and I'm not even talking just about Israel, any group that does that, any of my enemies, my friend, you start to lose your own, um, you start to earn your own, your own respectability. Like, I, I don't, I can't engage with you if I can't trust that you're actually doing this for the right reasons. Okay, thank you. Uh one theme I hear in the conversation here is about um, how these experiences of anti-Semitism are often very painful and how that pain when it comes to Jewish people is often ignored or dismissed. Do you want to speak to that 
issue? Uh, or how that's played out for you? I'll, I'll try to tackle it. Um, and just talking provincially and locally here, I think I'm the only University of Maryland person on the panel or direct University of Maryland person on the panel. And since we're sponsored by the University of Maryland, I think it behooves us to speak locally for the moment. And certainly there's room for other conversation. I mentioned before that there was a swastika on campus. And when should or should not a public statement be made? How do we balance that? Who makes that statement? Do we draw more attention to it? There's another incident just recently in Old Town, which is part of the Greek community where a lot of off-campus students live. There were some flyers that were anti-Semitic that were put around campus, around these houses. And once again, the university is silent. The reality is that it hasn't impacted Sorry, if you make a statement, it actually draws more attention to it. So where and when do you make those statements? I will sort of counter at the moment is when sadly there was a noose on campus and the noose is a hate symbol for you know African-American and black community. The university is making a public statement about it and needs to. And where do you draw that line? How often and when? And I think we need to come up with some, a game plan of how you do that and where it manifests itself. Um, and I think we need to do a better job of that. Um, so it happens here, it happens all over. And some of my Jewish colleagues will say, well, every time it happens, you need to you know, make a public statement. Well, then when you do that, you sort of lose the ability to make a public statement. And lastly, I will say that there was another incident two years ago here where a few Jewish students received some threatening text messages um, against their Jewish identity, against their, um, their beliefs. And uh, one student came forward, a first year student reached out to me. I reached out to the police and the administration and the administration was amazing and is amazing. And I wanna thank them holistically. Um, it ended up in a, an arrest, even though the student was trying to hide anonymously behind some technology, but it ended up in a crime and the student was expelled from campus and the university did make a public statement about that. And I'm grateful for that. And when, where do we do that, I think is a balancing act that I don't have a clear answer nor policy, but I do think we should work on that collectively. Okay, thank you. Yosef, were you gonna say something? Yeah, I, I wanna say, um, I, I believe Jasmine said at the very beginning that uh, like, or maybe I heard this, I don't know if this is exactly what she said, like anti-Semitism just hasn't been engaged with at the same level as other things, right? And what I, I, I am a big proponent of this simple idea. Anti-Semitism is under the umbrella of white supremacy. Racism is under the umbrella of white supremacy. And I argue that racism and anti-Semitism are both sides of the same coin. If you wanna get rid of anti-Semitism, you have to get rid of, of racism. If you want to get rid of racism, you have to get rid of anti-Semitism. If you only try and get rid of one of them, you're not going to get rid of the other. And what I use that to, to enlighten is that there needs to be the same level of commitment to both all the time, the same amount of vigor, fervor, financial backing, all that to go into dismantling anti-Semitism as there is in dismantling racism because they feed off each other to keep marginalized communities separate. And as someone who like lives in the middle of a Venn diagram of being black and Jewish, I get it from both ends. And so I, I have this innate ability to go like, oh no, these are both doing the exact same thing to two different communities that pit them against each other and keep them marginalized under the, the, the bigger uh, white, umbrella of white supremacy. And so I think those that that needs to just be acknowledged and kind of like just embraced. Thank you for your honest uh, answers, your honest responses, and your heartfelt responses. So, um, going to move off the topic of anti-Semitism um, for the time being and talk about the issue of Jewish pride. 
could you talk about Jewish pride, you know, being proud of your identity as a Jewish person and what that's meant for you and how it's been helpful to you in your life? Nilaya, do you want to start? Sure. Um, thanks, Julie. So for me, I think Jewish pride, um, especially based on the on the conversation that we just had together, is really not um, not characterizing Jewish identity based on anti-Semitism. Um, Judaism is such a vibrant religion. It's um, a vibrant and diverse community of faith and there's really so much more to it than the violence and aggression that um, we experience as, as Jews um, today and throughout the centuries. So I think um, Jewish pride for me has meant sharing a part of my identity um, that I love so much with my friends and my surroundings, really speaking up about what it means to be Jewish and um, finding part of Jewish culture or a tradition or um, a person in history who really resonates with you, depending on your interests and passions. Um, that's, that's, I think that's Jewish pride to me and something really beautiful and special that I've experienced um, during my time as a graduate student here at Yale has been um, just sharing Shabbat dinners with, um, with people from all over the Yale community and um, and wider New Haven community, it's been really amazing to see how comfortable um, students just feel bringing their friends from all different backgrounds to share in um, a warm and welcoming dinner and um, how this warmth and hospitality is really a special part um, and the community and family and home that you feel, um, that I especially feel is such, such a great part of, um, of Jewish identity for many people. So, that's how I would define Jewish pride. And it's really like, for me, been such an amazing experience studying religion um, the past two years um, as part of my graduate studies, because I've been really able to learn more about Judaism and Christianity and Islam in an academic setting, and also to meet so many amazing people and to share part of me with them, but also to, to learn about their backgrounds and, and values and faith. Yeah, thank you. I, I'll build off what Nilaya said about the Jewish pride for me is about a connection to others. Um, it's I feel I feel part of a rich tradition. Um, and I love the fact that we embrace and include others who are now a part of that tradition. We're not a we don't proselytize. And yet we embrace new people, as I mentioned before, about Yosef and that ability for new people to come in and influence my thoughts, add to add to it and really help sort of not only to add from a numbers game because we are a small people, but also add from a input and be a part and parcel of, of that conversation. Um, I love the fact that I'm part of a religion that's been around for thousands of years. Um, and, you know, I, it's not a joke and Mark Twain actually spoke about this and written, wrote about this, that the, I'm paraphrasing here, but the Persians and the Babylonians and the Roman empires sort of came and came and went and the Jewish people are still here. And I think there's something rich in that history and what my role in it, it is and how I play a role in it. And I think that really gives me a sense of purpose. And the pride really is about a sense of values that we, we talk about charity as a part and parcel of, of, of my identity and that obligation I spoke about before. And I actually love it. It gives me sort of a reason to wake up every day um, and when I put my children to sleep at night and I sing, you know, Jewish prayers with them, and this is what I remember growing up as a child, and I think there's just beauty to it that, that we continue to promote, um, and there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of opportunity for people to engage with it, the tradition, as well as a lot of the culture and food and, you know, spending time in Shabbat, uh, as Nilaya mentioned before, it's just that, that makes me proud and, and, and happy, and it's not about personal happiness, but it's about collective happiness and adding to it. I'll say I'm very I'm very happy to be Jewish. As someone who got to, to, to kind of pick, if you will, right, to be Jewish, um, I I try not to do things in my life 
halfway or lighthearted. I like tried to put a lot of thought and clarity into them before I do them. And so to be able to be here as a Jewish person is, is amazing for me. And as, as I'll say, it's as to be able to, to connect and engage with both the history and just the lineage that is Judaism, to, to know you're a part of, I mean, when I say my prayers, to know that people have been saying some version of these same prayers for the past 5,000 some odd years is powerful. It's powerful. When I'm putting my two, two now my two-year-old to sleep, and I'm seeing the Shema, one of the, the foundational prayers of Judaism to him, and he starts, and he sings it back with me, that's powerful for me. Um, and so being, for me, just, it's just, it means everything to me, being Jewish, really. That's, your, your responses are very beautiful. I hear uh, you talking about the strength um, that you receive being Jewish um, and having a Jewish identity, uh, the pride that it brings you um, and the utter joy that it brings you in terms of celebrating um, religions and cultural traditions, um, as well as the, the tie that you have to a people um, and a long, a long history of very important um, practices and experiences. I'm wondering if there is anything else um, that you'd like to say on this topic of Jewish identity uh, that I didn't ask or anything that struck you as we were having this conversation that you would like to talk about or include. I'll just add, and we've kind of already touched on this multiple times, like Judaism is not a monolith not like any other group of people, like there, there's no monoliths out there, like that's a fallacy, right? Judaism has so much different flavor and flair, some parts are a little spicier than others, um, that I just, I find there's a place for everyone in it who's in it, right? Um, I once had, I once had, and yeah, I'll just say that, there, there's a place for everyone in it and you can do it however you want. Rabbi Ari or Nalaya? Um, yeah, thank you. I Look, I'm enjoying uh, listening and learning from my co-panelists, and, and thank you really for instigating and thinking about these questions and helping us helping us grapple with it. Um, I think the, the pride issue, you know, that last question you asked before, and something, one of the reasons I've been on a college campus for 26 years is... And one of our mottos at, at our organization is our, our students are, are becoming excellent um, secondary school educators. They're becoming mechanical engineers, business leaders, um, psychologists, and so many other degrees. I hope that they also take pride and, and also graduate with a degree in Judaism and how it continues to grow with us as individuals and they don't sort of let their bar and bar mitzvah period, which is, you know, pre-adolescent to be honest, um, sort of stop their growth. And I use a parable all the time that just like today as a 20 year old, they're not wearing um, the same bar and bar mitzvah suit. It wouldn't fit them, right? If they put on their 13 year old suit, it wouldn't fit them. So too Judaism has to continue to evolve and change and grow with the time and understand where it fits in in the 21st century. And that balance of tradition and modernity is really where I embrace it and makes me proud to think about how we try to provide answers to why science provides what. And I think religion and Judaism works on the why. And I think it's asking, we have to continue to ask questions. And Israel is my last name, and this is my last moment, this statement that, uh, uh, for a moment is, Israel is my last name and the, the country of Israel um, as well as based on a biblical phrase and conversation with Jacob, one of our, our ancestors, it's about a struggle. It's about a struggle, and a struggle sometimes means asking questions, not always getting an answer why, and to continue in that journey. And that really makes me proud to understand I'm part of a journey, and it's not a period in time. As Yosef said as well, it's not one monolithic answer. The world is complex, and we have to embrace that complexity, 
and let's continue marching and moving forward and advancing it, you know, one moment, one conversation, one opportunity at a time. I'd also just like to add on um, just the question of Jewish pride and, and identity. Um, no matter where I am in the world, I always feel like I'm able to find my Jewish home somewhere, whether it's traveling on vacation or um, moving somewhere new. Um, Judaism is really, it's, it's, become a, it's become a family for me and something that some of my friends and I joke about um, just lightheartedly is Jewish geography. Um, sometimes you're in one place and somehow your friend knows your cousin or like your friend knows your friend who knows your friend and you all know each other in some way, um, no matter what parts of the world you're, you're in. So um, just being part of such a diverse community of people, um, regardless of where you are in the world, what you look like, um, what you decide to practice or not practice, um, just having that sense of Judaism and that awareness that um, an embrace of Jewish identity, and that's something that you hold in your heart, I, I think that's um, something that connects Jews around the world, no matter what their background is. Thank you, everybody. I definitely hear with all the panelists this the strength of um, identity, just having a really strong uh, and solid identity, which is so important to sort of human growth and development, right? Being comfortable with yourself and who you are, uh, which allows for one to be comfortable with diverse others as well. So, um, there are, there's a question that I saw in the, in the Q&A earlier on, um, and it looks like this was directed to Yosef. This is in the chat, rather. Um, Joseph, uh, I don't know if you could see this. It's from Karen Sim. I will agree that there is a big Venn diagram overlap between white supremacy and racism, but what about anti-Semitism on the left side of the political spectrum? You know that's a that's a great point. And, but what I want I want to clarify first, um, the Venn diagram isn't between white supremacy and racism. For me, the Venn diagram is between racism and anti-Semitism under the umbrella of white supremacy. And I would also offer, we need to call anti-Semitism everywhere, just like we need to call it racism everywhere, right? Um, like on. Been like our 46th president somewhere in there right we've had one two people of color in the white house right one is president one and vice president i don't care what side of the political spectrum you're on there's some racism going on there none of them have been jewish right they've all been some flavor of protestant and two catholics so like it doesn't matter what end of the political spectrum you're on you need to, you need to dig out uh, for, for leaving so I, I think I'm tick. So like dig out the tick that is racism, dig out the tick that is anti-Semitism. Have no patience for it. Don't let it sit, don't let it fester. You got to get rid of all those things. And I'm not talking about just racism, anti-Semitism, talking about Islamophobia, I'm talking about um any of the isms and phobias you can put out there. I, I would argue phobias aren't really phobias or isms, but get rid of them all. We can't have a society in which we're free to engage with each other if we have all these little things going on in the background, they don't help us. Does anyone want to respond to that? Does anyone else want to respond? My internet is a little unstable here. Um, Okay, uh, I hope you can hear me now. I'm sort of going in and out. We're losing you, Julie. Yeah, Jasmine, just um, my internet's unstable. Um, well, I'm assuming that most of the audience members here are 
at the University of Maryland or connected to a college campus, although that assumption may be incorrect. Um, that's my assumption. So I'm, I'm wondering if you'd like to talk uh, any further about you know, what we're seeing on college campuses for, for Jewish students. I know Rabbi, Rabbi Ari, you're very engaged in that in particular, and as are uh, Yosef. Um, any, anything you'd like to talk about with regard to sort of Jewish students, their experiences on college campuses these days, um, and kind of their experiences with anti-Semitism and ways to foster the uh, pride and a strong identity as we've been talking about. I'm happy to jump in, but Nilaya Yosef, do you... All right, I'll take one here. <laughs> okay. I um, I I do want to comment about the when Julie, you did cut out a little bit before about the question for Yosef, and I do fear about the anti-Semitism both from the right and from the left, and I think we need to call it out. Um, it's not about simply white supremacy, which is a lot easier and uh, palpable is probably the wrong question, but in the wrong statement. But when in Charlottesville, they're, they're you know, at an anti-monument, anti-taking down monuments, they're chanting, you know, Jews shall not replace us is clean and, and clear about what that makes me as a Jew feel in, in America. Um, I think there's also anti-Semitism when we have a double standard about Israel. Um, there's anti-Semitism that comes from some intersectionality um, where we critique Israel for um, pinkwashing, you know, which is that Israel is not LGBT enough or not LGBT enough. And if you look at the Middle East, and it's not about a comparison here, and if you look at the Middle East, um, LGBT rights are preserved in Israel to some extent, not a full extent as we have in America. And I hope that we can embrace the reality that there are a lot of Muslims and non-Jews who are part and parcel of the Israeli fabric. And we have to realize that Israel is a diverse country. Israel, like any democracy, has challenges. We in America are faced with challenges, as Yosef spoke about before. Um, and we have to continue to work at making everyone comfortable and welcome. I also wanted to make a distinction. There's some conversation in the Q&A about, you know, what, what about oppression and Palestinians and land, et cetera, and making distinctions between Israel proper and Israel in terms of the um, disputes that have been going on since 1948 and 1967. And it's complicated. I don't want to get into right now in a history lesson. Um, and I pray every day that there will be peace. And I want to work hard for my Palestinian friends and neighbors. And I hope that there is a Palestinian state that could be peaceful and that could be, you know, established. And that we as Jews, Muslims, Christians can, can get together and learn from each other um, and celebrate it. I know many Muslims, and I have my, my colleague and dear friend on campus, Tarif, is the Muslim chaplain, and we work super well together. And there is a lot of common in religion and values that we have to share. And I pray for that day when there will be this opportunity for all of us to put aside, as I do, the, 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 uh, the story and put, turn it into a plowshare where we can learn and eat and break bread together. Julie, I'd love to um, address your question about anti-Semitism on college campuses. Um, I actually graduated from undergrad not too long ago in 2019, um, so might have some uh, fresh perspectives from current student and also former um, undergrad. Um, but I think it's important for students of all backgrounds, not only Jewish students, to recognize anti-Semitism and the different um, mechanisms available on college campuses, on UMD's campus, um, when you do see anti-Semitism happen, whether it's to your friends or passing, um, passing in an instant and in passing, but um, not to be a bystander. And by saying something, um, it could really make a difference. I mean, you never know. Uh, Ari, Rabbi Ari, and um, Yosef had talked about how these incidents can really affect um, individuals. Like they've definitely affected me as a person and as a student. I mean, 
hate is hate and um, prejudice reduction is something that is so important and something that Yosef touched on, upon when talking about the connections um, between racism and anti-Semitism and um, just recognizing that and saying something can really make a difference in one of your friends' lives or um, in, in, your, in your community. So um, I know that, uh, that the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at UMD is holding several upcoming panels on anti-Semitism. So um, I am grateful for the opportunity to, um, for the wider UMD community to explore some of these questions more in depth. I would, I would ask, uh, there's something we haven't talked about, like in regards to uh, college campuses and anti-Semitism, which is, it's one of those, like when I said, there's like a lot of low key kind of anti-Semitic things that happen, like, and the calendar is not set up for Jews or Muslims or anyone who's not Christian. Like if you look at the academic year calendar, that's not set up for people who aren't Christian. Like, and that's like one of those like kind of like, things that most people don't kind of like realize. It's one of those like low key things. Like winter break used to be Christmas break. Spring break used to be Easter break, right? These, these parts of the calendar are not designed for Jewish folks. I remember um, I've only had the privilege of working at one Jewish institution. I probably work at non-Jewish institutions. And it was the first time I didn't have to use all of my leave every year for Jewish holidays. And I was mind blown. I'm like, wait, I still have sick time and vacation time after the Jewish holidays? Well, how does that work? Because everywhere else I work, oh, yeah, you can take the day off. You know, that's like a federal law. And you need to make that time up somewhere else. And it's like, well, where am I going to make the time up if I'm working all the other time? So, like, I think that's another one of those things when we're talking about college campuses, anti Semitism. Sure, you can take off for Rosh Hashanah but you're gonna miss the lecture that day. Sure, you can take off for Yom Kippur a week later and you're gonna miss the lecture that day too. So when we start talking about these things, how do we make the actual school environment more equitable from a structural standpoint, as well as from a uh, emotional and spiritual standpoint? There's, yeah. a, there's a question in the uh, Q&A about, um, perspectives on Jewish converts. What are the perspectives on Jewish converts between Jewish communities or how do Jewish communities view Jewish converts? Anyone want to take that? I mean, I can as a Jewish convert. Um, I'll say this, I can't speak for all communities. All communities are different. Um, usually if it's a community you converted in, you're all right. There's no issue because you converted. It, it's not really an issue of um, will you be welcomed in or not, or are there any major issues? Um, the Talmud says, you know, you shall welcome in your converts because as Rabbi Ari was saying, like more esteemed than this than the quote born Jew because you chose to be here. I remember at my uh, Beit Din, which is like the the Jewish court when you're converting. My Rabbi looked at me and says, "Are you really sure you want to do this?" Like. <laughs> He's like, you have to take on anti-Semitism. I said, well, I have to deal with racism already. So what's another, just another thing on top? Uh, I wish I hadn't made that quite of a joke about it, but it's, it's a thing. And it's, there usually isn't an issue as far as I've experienced. Yeah, I just, I'll add to that. And thank you, Jose, for, for uh, starting that. And um, most people, I hope most Jews and most human beings are pretty comfortable with differences. You're always going to find certain people that are uncomfortable with those differences. And unfortunately that manifests itself across the board. Um, and Judaism, traditional Judaism puts a very high value on converts. We have one of our 24 books of the Bible is actually named in honor of a convert and her story. Ruth is a part and parcel of our tradition so much so that we firmly believe that the Messiah, the Davidic line of that Messiah of King David stems from her as a convert. And my son Akiva, uh, my baby is named in honor of Rabbi Akiva, 
who also was a descendant of converts. So converts can assume the highest levels in Judaism. And it's actually not about where you come from, but where we're heading. And I hope that's really an opportunity for everyone to, you know, I, the parable for me is, you know, we're all on a rung of life. It's not what rung you're on, it's which direction you're going in. And I hope we have an opportunity to lend a hand and help others climb that. And it's not about convert or, or a person who was born Jewish. It's really about how we're in the struggle and opportunity together to learn from each other. Thank you. So um, Rabbi Ari, as you mentioned prior, there are, um, there are a couple of questions um, related to Palestinian issues in the Q&A. Um, and one of these questions is, how is calling out Israel's illegal occupation of Palestinian land anti-Semitic? Is this merely a tactic to scare people away from talking about these tragedies? Does anyone feel they could respond to that? Yosef, you're muted. I saw your hand raised. Uh, I, 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 for, I want to clarify. Um, it's a loaded statement, right? It's a loaded statement. Um, and I don't say that in a bad way. I, I think it, it has a certain perspective. And what I think is important when you're going to have these conversations, um, you know, it's the what what I was what we were talking about. When I think when this question came in was the hyper focus only on Israel, right? So it, it, to, to 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 a certain degree, answering the rest of the question is it's it's the hyper focus. Like, are you talking about Russia and taking over the Crimea? Are you talking about China and Tibet? Are you talking about the United States and Native American uh, land? Or are you only talking about Israel and focusing all your energy on Israel? That is when it starts to take on that, um, that flavor of anti-Semitism, right? If, if you're talking about, I want from reading this question, justice for people whose land was taken away, then you need to have justice for people whose land was taken away across the board. It's when those types of things become hyper-focused only on Israel, and then that's when it starts to become anti-Semitic. And I, I wish I knew who it was, it just as an honest attendee, uh, I would happily continue the conversation with you. Um, because I, I think that there's nuance to these conversations. And I think some of the, the kind of oftentimes written as a gotcha statement aren't helpful. And I think that having, the, having just an open, honest dialogue is much more fruitful in a lot of ways. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo, I'll echo Yosef, and thank you, Yosef, for taking that softball question. Um, that was that was great, and uh, and running with it. I, I agree. Um, I do not and will not ascribe a critique of Israel or the state of Israel as anti-Semitic by itself. I think we all, as human beings, have opinions and. Most opinions are going to be opinionated, and some of those opinions are going to offend people, and we're just going to continue to hear stuff um, that isn't comfortable. I talk all the time, and it goes back to the anti-Semitic piece, and I'll, I'll try to address the, the piece with the Palestinian conversation in a second. I talk all the time about how college a lot of times is be, being uncomfortable. You're going to hear things that people disagree with you. I think it borders sometimes, and what we have to be vigilant is about when you are unsafe and that balance between being uncomfortable and unsafe. And when you're critiquing Israel as a Jewish state um, and making outlandish, I'll use that word, and it's not a comfortable word, outlandish statements that Israel is a Nazi state or Israel is perpetuating genocide or um, ethnic cleansing. I'm using those words because those are words that are spewed out I firmly believe those are anti-Semitic statements. If you want to critique Israel for um, some of its policies, and as Yosef said, you're critiquing others, not equally because everyone's going to have their own bias, um, but Natan Sharansky, who is you know, one of the leaders of the Jewish sort of people, a, a hero in his own right, in terms of his own story, talks about the double standards. And where are those double standards? And I think there are a lot of lines that are crossed and making distinctions between Israel and um, some of the Palestinian lands and 
dismissing Israel's right to Jerusalem, um, falsifying historical records, um, I think truly borders on anti-Semitism. And when you're, and as I started before, it's part and parcel of my identity. Zion, and answering that question from before, Zion is a hill in Jerusalem um, in the Bible. And I hope the values of Israel from quoting Isaiah is that from Zion shall come forth teaching. And there's a lot of teaching and values that we have to teach the world and all of us can learn from each other. And God in our story created all of us in God's image. And I think that's a beautiful component of our Jewish story that the Bible does not start with the Jews. It starts with Adam and Eve. Um, and the Jews are a piece of God's world and we're all created in God's image. Rabbi Ari, thank you so much for, um, for going more in depth into that. I think it's exactly what you said. Um, just the, the critique of Israel as a Jewish state and the examples that you provided um, are, I, I would agree wholeheartedly with you. And I think it's important to recognize that like, Israel is a very diverse country. Um, Muslims, Christians, Jews, um, many cultures, religions are living alongside one another. And by supporting the existence of Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state, in no means means um, that Jews as a whole or, um, or, or Jews support oppression of other people in any way. I mean, like Rabbi Ari said, my, um, my dream is also for um, Israelis to live in peace with their neighbors and Jews to live in peace with um, Muslims and Christians and people of different faiths around the world. And I think it's important to um, also recognize the biases and assumptions that are often made when speaking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Zionism, and its connection to uh, Judaism and anti-Semitism. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, which maybe I shouldn't add, because when you add, you can <laughs> step on something. Um, Israel's in a tough neighborhood. It just is. Um, there are many unfortunate um, enemies of Israel that are bent firmly on its destruction. And there are terrorist states and terrorist actors that are wantonly killing um, innocent civilians. I'm not justifying war in any shape or form. And yet I think we need to be pretty clear that when someone threatens you um, and they've carried out that threat, one needs to protect themselves. And Israel has an army that needs to protect itself. I wish it didn't need to protect itself. Um, and Israel also has ethical reviews. And, you know, unfortunately, if a soldier does something that is um, wrong, and we can have conversations about what ethics means, there's, there's a process. And I think that's amazing that Israel has that ability and continues to do its best. Um, unfortunately, you know, America just killed 10 innocent uh, civilians in, in, uh, in Kabul. Um, it's awful, awful that they you had that. Was that a mistake? Sure, it's a mistake. So it, armies make mistakes; they just do. Unfortunately, you're you know you're asking individuals to protect themselves and protect lives of innocent people, um, and they have to continue to do a good job and a better job, um, and and call it out when you see it. Um, but when anti-Israel individuals go back to that statement before have a chant that says "From the Israel to the sea." Palestine will be free is not actually about a disputed territory. That's about pushing Israel and the Jewish state and all Jews into an ocean. How do you not make that statement and say that's anti-Semitic? I don't know. I'm sorry. And I'm get emotional if you need me to, but I'll do my best. Okay. Well, thank you. I, I think we're at time. We're a minute over time. I want to thank you all for this conversation. Um, I found it very enlightening, insightful, and I really enjoyed it. Um, you made so many important points about what Jewish identity means. Um, and you also made very important points about the diversity of the Jewish people and the fact that Jews are not a monolith. I think these conversations are vitally important and I want to give my thanks and appreciation to all of these panelists who've been very courageous in their responses. And I wanna give my thanks to the University of Maryland for holding this very important conversation. So thank you everybody.
Thank you all. Uh, once again, we really appreciate what you've shared with our community and what you've shared with our campus um, and the insights that folks are taking away. Um, to, the, to our uh, audience, please know that this will be an ongoing series. We will continue to revisit this conversation um, and these conversations really in an effort to work towards and build towards um, a campus and society that really centers and values anti-oppression. Be well, we will see folks at our next installment, which we'll be announcing in a couple of weeks. So take care and we'll see you Thank then. You.